strike the earth extensively and hit living entities here would generate all kinds of problems, producing, among other things, a bunch of free radicals. But anyway, chemists thought some years ago that they had a solution to another problem. That problem thing they could use as a propellant, something that they could use as a refrigerant, something that they could use to clean these, these chips that go in computers. They found chlorofluorocarbons, wonderfully non-reactive compounds. They seemed to, be, seemed to be very, very safe to use. They were not flammable. Until as they used them, they began to discover that the ozone layer was being decimated. Why? Because these chlorofluorocarbons, such as Freon-12 or R-12, were breaking down in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And when they broke down, they would produce free radicals. And these free radicals would attack the ozone in the ozone layer, causing it to form oxygen, O2 and repeating the free radicals. Well, the thought might be, well, O2, okay, so what's the problem? The problem is that O2 doesn't protect us like O3 does. We've got to have the O3. And furthermore, when these free radicals are regenerated, they come back and attack more ozone molecules, converting that to oxygen, generating free radicals, and go around again. A chlorine-free radical, for example, can take out as many as 80,000 ozone molecules. So it's back to the drawing board. To try to find compounds that will do the jobs that we need done, such as act as refrigerants or propellants or things of this type, but compounds that will be safe because we must protect our ozone layer. Now let's look at polar bonds. You've heard of polar bonds before. These are bonds formed by the unequal sharing of a pair according to the model that we're working with. The more electronegative atom will have a greater share of the electron pair. Do you remember what electronegativity is? We talked about it as the attraction of an atom for electrons. And it's actually the attraction an atom has for its own outer shell electrons. But it is expanded to consider electrons in general. Let's note trends. Let's review our table of electronegativities and look at trends. Here's the table of electronegativities. And you will recall that electronegativity increases in these directions. Fluorine was the most electronegative element. Francium was theoretically the most electropositive. So electronegativity increases in this general direction. Characteristics of polar bonds. They're characterized by the presence of dipoles. Dipoles are equal and opposite charges separated in space. And when you have equal and opposite charges separated in space, you have something we call a dipole. Let me show you. Consider HCl, gas. This is a polar molecule. You have hydrogen bonded to chlorine. But the, the hydrogen is somewhat positive. That's a delta positive, meaning a ch change toward positive. And the chlorine is a change toward negative, or delta negative. Chlorine has the greater access to the electrons. It is more electronegative. It pulls on the pair of electrons harder. So the hydrogen is somewhat positive and the chlorine is somewhat negative. And we indicate this by drawing an arrow in the direction from positive to negative charge. And if we draw a, can draw a single arrow to reflect this, draw a single arrow with a bar from the center of the positive to the center of the negative, that shows what we call a net dipole moment. You will understand net dipole moment better if you've ever studied vectors. And when you look at another example, 
Let's consider the water molecule. Here's the shape of it, and you know that the hydrogens are less electronegative than the oxygens. So the hydrogens are somewhat positive, and the oxygen is somewhat negative. Are there dipoles? And the answer is, oh yes. You can draw arrows showing the direction from positive toward the negative charge. There's a dipole there, and there's a dipole here. Now the question you have to ask is, if you have two different dipoles, is there a net dipole moment? Can you draw a single arrow to show a general direction of the flow of charge? And the answer is yes. Well, where is it? In what direction is the net dipole moment? And it's right there. Going from the center of positive, which is between the two hydrogens, to the center of negative, which is toward the oxygen. Well, let's continue with this. Let's do a review of the bond types and talk about how to predict. There's a quick set of rules we can use. Remember what we said about ionic bonding, that if you have elements from the S and D blocks bonding with nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or negative polyatomic ions, those bonds are probably ionic, and others are some form of covalent. And if you think you're dealing with a covalent structure, you better check for a net dipole moment. If the covalent compound has a net dipole moment, the bonding is then polar covalent. If the covalent compound does not have a net dipole moment, bonding is nonpolar covalent. There's something you need to look at, though. Consider carbon dioxide. Carbon is 4, picks up none for oxygen, gives us a total of 4, divided by 2 is 2. That means the structure is linear. So we have carbon in the center and bonded to two oxygens. And I have distributed those four electrons so as to give the carbon uh, access to eight electrons. The structure has to be linear. And of course, if you went through and tracked the other electrons, you'd find them distributed about that if you did a Lewis structure. Now, let's look at the dipoles for a moment. The carbon is somewhat positive, and the oxygens are somewhat negative. So which way are the dipoles? Well, they go from positive to negative. So there's one in this direction, and there's one in this direction. Are we getting anywhere? Is there a single arrow that can be drawn? And the answer is no, there's no single arrow that can be drawn. The dipoles are exactly opposing each other. Hence, there is no net dipole moment. Therefore, the carbon dioxide molecule, for your purposes, is nonpolar, a nonpolar molecule. Try ammonia. Now, we went through the process. I went through the process, figured out the geometry, knew that it was tetrahedral. It has a lone pair. Is the sharing of the pairs equal? Hmm. Do you have dipole moments? Well, there's a dipole in that direction, dipole in that direction, a dipole in that direction, because nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So can you draw a single resultant dipole? And the answer is yeah, right up through here. Well, if you can, then what does that tell you about the bonding? What is the resultant bonding? And the resultant bonding is polar covalent. Polar covalent. Got the idea? What are these? Yeah, you know what they are. They are lone pair electrons. Well, we've covered ionic bonding. We talked about the cases in which ionic bonds formed. We talked about the lattice network, things of that type. Then we talked about covalent bonds and sharing. We talked about covalent bonds and sharing and, and the, the electron distributions. 
We talked about Lewis structures and how to, how to perform the operations that are needed to design Lewis structures. We talked about resonance hybrids, that interesting idea that you can have multiple parents with a hybrid offspring and that you can't describe the, the offspring very well with electron distribution, so you do it by describing the parents. And some parents contribute a lot to the hybrid offspring, and some contribute very little. We talked about formal charges as a way of helping us clarify which structures were better. We talked about the octet exceptions and promised to, to do more work with this in the next unit. And we wrapped up on polar bonds. It has been an interesting unit. A better way to teach and learn chemistry.